So uh, last time we left off talking about the interval between the first and the second take in the room, right? So、uh, the first and the second, or the slate? I can't remember. Well, we can even like revisit anything more we want to say about like you know the time. I think I was talking about the time I give people after you know I've slated them to say, okay, I say take your time and let me know when you're ready. And I would rather them take time to do what they got to do, and if they need to vocalize whatever they want to do to make sure we get a great first take. As opposed to using the first take as practice and to arrive, right? right? And then you know after that first take, and I think did I mention how I'll yeah I think I mentioned I'll cut people in the middle of it if it's like like I already see where this is going. Let's just correct this and save the extra yeah, time waiting for it to、yeah. end. And then after it's after it's done、uh, with the the second take. Like for me, I've always told people that the purpose of multiple takes is to show range, but not to do something completely off the wall different than what we initially did. Just not an, the same buttons, not a carbon copy. There's no point to give me a carbon copy. Yeah. Like still in the same neighborhood, but just a new, fresh discovery and experience. Yeah, it's keeping it fresh. I like. I'm just doing callbacks for this one director who he he doesn't very rarely he does he give like redirects, but he's always wants you to do three takes. So I was like, great, do it again. Great, do it again. And I see this like fear in people's eyes of like not knowing what that means,、mm-hmm. and I keep saying to them outside the room, like, just bring something fresh, bring something fresh. And it's like that's the same thing you have to do in your first call.、Mm-hmm. I think that that's the biggest thing for everybody. If, if people could come away with one thing here from this podcast, it's you guys have options. Be willing to play. Don't come in with different take, different button, different lead in. It's a, it's a, it's a different. Moments in this character's life because you can come in and have the best freaking button and nail it, or you know, even if they say up at the top of the scene, yeah, lead us in with something up at the top and whatever. Okay, cool. The first scene, brilliant, funny, everything works. All your moments of spontaneity and creativity are great. Your button kills. Do not do that same button again because when when you look back on it, the first time it happens, it's. Oh, that was brilliant! And then the second time you see that very same thing play out, oh, that's all they have. It's hearing the same joke twice. Yes. Yeah. Once you've already heard a joke, you know the punchline. It's just not going to do anything for you. You know. And the reason, the justification I usually give for that, is because they've got you on set for eight, ten hours to do a thirty-second thing, and they're going to want some variety. Versus like a TV show or film where they've got to shoot six eight pages、mm-hmm. and they've got a day to do it, so、and、they don't have, have time to play. Exactly, they don't have time to play as much. So that's why they want to see. I think that variety because they're not if something if they get some gold or something really great, they're going to grab that. But they don't want you to do exactly the same like a robot. That's that's not going to fill you know that ten hours of the day which everyone is there committed to or, or longer you know or less. You know? And I think the thing too that people forget is、um, in America. The director doesn't do the edit. The ad agency does the edit, and so the director really has to bring them a lot of options to to the table. And they may want to do a thirty and a fifteen and some multimedia things. And so the director needs to know that you're going to be able to like bring a lot of things. You don't just have one joke、mm-hmm. in in your pocket that you can you can bring. You can you can. Bring this character into a variety of places,、mm-hmm. and a lot of times after that first take, I'll just say when we give feedback or notes, sometimes it's like you know don't do that or correct this. But a lot of times we're also trying to give you creative ideas or more options, so it's less of like a critique and more of like hey, let's make this fun for them to watch. Let's make this fun for us. Let's make it entertaining, and and so we're we're giving you. More stuff to play with than、mm-hmm. getting in your head and saying, "Oh, I did it wrong."、Yes. You know what I mean? That's the other thing. Like those more options, a lot of times are great. Like the, when they spend more time with you, either in a callback or when we do, that's a great sign. You know? Yeah. People can feel a lot of pressure when they're,、um, you know, asked to do lead-ins and buttons and things like that, or they know that improv is going to be part of the experience or something. To feel like they have to generate it all there in the moment on the second that it's asked of you. Whereas you know what works for me and what works for other performers that really impresses me is before they go in the room, I see them outside, like actually coming up with ideas and practicing and rehearsing and thinking of things. I know there was a, a the Reese's commercial that I shot with Lindsay Vaughn.、Mm-hmm. You know that was like you know me being an archery instructor and her completely being a disaster and putting everybody's lives at risk with how she was using the bow and aiming it at people and this and that. 
And so, you know, I was standing outside the callback room knowing that they were going to want to play with all that, just thinking of all the different things I would say or could imagine happening if she was pointing the bow in my direction. What would I do? How would I behave if she wasn't holding it correctly? All that stuff. And then it paved the way so that in the room, I, my body was already primed to come up with ideas in the moment. It wasn't yeah. just like Bleh, where I'm like, OK, I, come, I came up with one good idea and that's the only one I'm going to have take after take or you know, that kind of thing. Well, and I think that like because I've heard some um, like teachers and even some session directors who will um, advise like don't think of buttons before you go in just do it in the room and I understand why they say it but I I think it's misleading because I think you do have to prime the pump I think you do need to think of a bunch of ideas have some things like ready to go but also be willing to never say them once mm -hmm. you get in the room because mm -hmm. you have to go with what's genuine in the moment and you may have yeah, you don't want it to feel, feel staged exactly yeah. and you may have come up with like the perfect button but once you get in there with that other person and the way that scene goes down that button just doesn't fit mm -hmm. anymore and you have to be willing to like know that that was beautiful yeah, and no one's ever going to hear it if you jam it in there we feel it we you know totally what I mean? and, feel and it that's yeah i agree exactly those, yeah, those kind of yeah. But, uh, and i like that term you use prime the pump you do you have to you have to warm up when you go in to work out you got to get those couple warm-up sets in you first to get in your body mm -hmm. you don't always get the sides sorry charles bef like the day before you get it usually when you show up for commercial stuff mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. why not spend that extra 20 15 minutes get there early I mean, yes, everyone has busy days, but it's like the payoff is huge. Jeez, and yeah. I feel not enough people um, do that, especially when it's a decent amount of copy or something that they can have fun with. And I always advise too, like just write stuff on the copy, you know, write it down or say it out loud. So you exactly, I think it's a great way to, to, to do a little prep. I also think that, sorry, Charles. Mm -hmm. I also think that sometimes people get so about improv and buttons and all of that kind of stuff that they forget that nonverbal buttons can be just as funny. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Just a look, uh, a sigh, uh, you know, those kinds of things can be brilliant. And I think that comes from the world. I always feel like it comes from the world of the office. So when I first started running sessions, the office was like the huge show. And then everybody referred to the office for the comedy. And, and the office comedy was very understated in certain ways. And I think a lot of that was a look like Jim looking at the camera and things like that. And I think that still kind of resonates a lot. So I think you're definitely right. There's a lot of that behavior or, or physical that you can use also. Well, a lot of actors feel like uh, they people forget you are every bit as important when you're not speaking as when you are. People think, oh, watch me now. I have words. This is the important stuff. And then the other actor starts talking and then they check out and they're waiting to hear the silence to then say their important stuff. But no, we're watching you process what is being said. And so those little nonverbal moments that just being alive and being present it really does that that brings that granularity that that texture to the scene well i tell people it's acting is not about the words it's about the behavior mm -hmm. if we just wanted to know the words we'd read the script we wouldn't need actors we Correct. need actors to watch the behavior in these stories and we're not i've also found that in voice work when you stay engaged even when it's not your line it brings a better performance out of the other. Sure. Actors. So it's not just about your performance. I think it elevates the whole room. Well, sure. And I think sometimes we, people get into into commercials thinking that we're selling and we're not. And like that's something that's gone away. It's like we're not there to sell the product. We're not there to sell the service. We're there to have a relationship with the other characters and with maybe the service or maybe the product. But it's it's about creating a real world and and that's your job as the actor is to create that world just like you would in a movie or a TV show. And it's, and, and, and it can be tricky sometimes because you have to have that actor brain that understands why you're there, what you're selling. You know, if you're, if you're selling a car, you're not going to like, you know, and, and there's a specific feature like, yeah, you can't be like hating that feature or something like that. That doesn't make sense. But at the same time, like, it's not about that. The mm -hmm, director right. and the ad yes. agencies yeah. is selling it. You're there to be that person and engage in that world. Yeah. And I was thinking of, um, Sean, you were talking about behavior. And I remember I had a call back for a Bud Light commercial. Uh, and there was like five of us. And whenever you have five people and it's kind of improv, it turns into a free for all with oh. everyone trying to get in the funny stuff and everyone trying to talk. And it's like, how do you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the spot was with um, Kobayashi, who used to be the hot dog eating champion. Do you guys remember that guy? He, he used to win all the, yeah, do you remember that? Yeah. So competitive eating. competitive eating, exactly. So he was like that. So I remember being there with four other people. Everyone's trying to get in their jokes and everyone's trying to, you know, this is in a callback. 
And on the little table we were at, there was like they had put some creamers just to kind of set the bar. And my choice, because I was like couldn't get in, is I took the creamers and started kind of tossing them towards the camera like I was feeding them to him because like he eats everything, right? So I was like, you know, and I ended up booking the commercial. I don't know if that's what got it for me, but it was like, I can't get in a word edgewise. What's a fun behavior that can be kind of of interesting, you know, if this guy eats everything, I'm sure whatever I'm throwing at him could be hot dogs or whatever, and he's just swallowed, you know. So that was my way I thought of that was creative, that still fit in the world, that was not, you know, forcing my agenda because I was like, okay, you know, I don't want to battle with other people. Well, this leads know? me to a fun thing for us. Let's talk about the different types of, like, I mean, not, not every commercial is the same as every commercial, but there's definitely buckets of types of commercials, mm-hmm. right? So I think we talked last week about the uh, the driving, how nobody drives cranking the wheel right to left, <laughs> but they don't know what to do when they sit down. You also mentioned something about eating, eating. right? Nobody eats like a human in an audition, <laughs> right. Uh, and we talked about nodding, like you can't see something without nodding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, so, you know, when we talk about eating, how should people eat, Charles? When you have like a commercial where you need to be eating something, we'll normally have like some white bread, some Wonder Bread, little like Hawaiian buns, like something that you can just eat a little nibble of just to like get your, you know, or sometimes we've actually said you got to take like at least a substantial enough bite that we can see your jaw moving or something so that... It isn't just like a dainty little delicate thing. One thing we will say is don't you dare say you'll eat the product if you actually won't eat the product product. when you get there with the biting stuff. But how should people eat in a biting in a bite and smile? Uh, Okay. When you take that bite, you know how when in real life, if you eat something and you'll go, "Mm," you'll close your eyes and you'll kind of crunch. "Mm, That's so good. That crunching of your eyebrows together actually looks like you're in pain. Mm -hmm. So, or that you hate it or that you hate it. So don't do that. If anything, I tell everybody, relax the muscles of your face and let your eyes just light up a little bit because when you bite into something, hmm, there's just a little moment where your eyes can light up and it softens your face and it, 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 it reads immediately. But when you go, Oh, that's so good. And your face, and we all do it Mm -hmm. and your face crunches up. It looks, if you were to turn the sound down, like, ooh, he's hurting. That's, that's, that's not that's not. And that's right that's something you wouldn't realize because your natural behavior is to do something that reads very different on camera. That reads differently on camera. Um, also, when you take the bite, again, don't nod. Yeah. Like, this is the great... <laughs> Mmm, this is fantastic. If, <laughs> if we all nodded like that, we'd all be struck with vertigo every time we take a bite of food because everybody's heads are bobbing up and down all the time. We don't do that. So what I suggest is grab some food, go to a mirror and take a bite and just look at yourself eating. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then bring that behavior into the room. You know, if you like it, if it's sour and you make a little sour face, you know, you know what your faces look like. We are in a medium that is on camera. So it behooves you to rehearse on camera. It, Storytellers Conservatory, all the stuff that the four of us always teach and everything that, that we move forward, get yourself on camera. Everyone has a camera. Everyone, apparently my wife's phone has like 15 different cameras on it. I can't get any of them to work, but <laughs> it, we all have access to it. See yourself, see how you emote. I have found that if I just sit there with a neutral look on my face, people tell me, you look like you're really intimidating, like you wanna beat me up and I don't, but I have to be cognizant of that's just how says I, the I built look. guy with the yeah. goatee and the shaved head. <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm did, a puppy dog. Big right? shocker. <laughs> but I, I, I told that to an actor once in my room, and I was just just in the midst of redirects, and I was like, just you've got a face that just is naturally looks sad and angry. Like you, so you think you're smiling, that's your neutral. Then you have to give me a little bit more. And then I saw her at a party like a year and a half later. And she was like, that was the best advice I'd ever gotten. I've been like working on that and stuff that, because you don't know, you don't know, you know, I, How are you I'm supposed the same to way. unless you see it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but I, um, uh, going off of that, cause I, I just actually did one of these bite and smile spots the other day of, uh, I think two, people get into this habit of like, then it's the same each time too. It's this, mmm, 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 that's so good. And it's like, find also different, like pick different foods. Like, ooh, this one, I don't know if I'm going to like it, 
but actually it's it's actually surprising once it's in my mouth. Oh, this is actually pretty good. Or this is my favorite. I totally know what this is going to taste like. This is sweet. This is, like you said, sour. Allow, what does that look like on your face? Yeah. And and I did one of these, a callback years ago when I was still in Toronto of like a burrito, a breakfast burrito at McDonald's. And I was like, mm, mm, mm. and the director literally said to me, you're not selling the product. I am. Mm. Stop that. Yeah. And it was like, it was such a good note. Well, it can be counterintuitive to think that not every bite you take, does it have to be an orgasmic experience? It shouldn't. It can just be, you're talking with friends and you're enjoying the food, but it doesn't mean that every bite it's is not changing you. your world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, well, and on that note, for the love of all that's holy, please don't put your actual lips and mouths on our <sighs> prop <laughs> because you have no idea how many people it's are accidentally doing yeah. it, getting carried away, whatever. Like, please don't put can, your lips. Can I honestly, <laughs> I had this session once. It was for um, Burger King, I think, and we had to have actual burgers. But we only had three of them for the entire day. And so we said to everyone, don't eat don't it. Eat it. <laughs> Just pretend. And then people would just get into it. And then they'd take this huge bite. And we'd be watching going, well, we have to keep using that because we only have three. <laughs> then there'd be a big mouth-sized bite, bite out. And then other people are like pretending. And then someone else would just get excited oh, and eat. And I'm like, but you can literally see there's a bite out of it already. People get so crazy in the moment. So just don't, don't do it. That's how people get AIDS. <laughs> That's not true. That's, That's not, not true. true. <laughs> That's just a doctor. I have to say that it's not true. Thank God. We're we not affiliated with Sean or his beliefs. Exactly. It's, scary. It's, scary. <laughs> it's not backed up by science. It's just a scare tactic. Well, herpes at the very least. That's yeah. how people get hurt. <laughs> right. Yes, herpes. Boom, done. Or, or just uh. spreading plaque. Oh. So I want to just mention, you know, other, other commercials we get a lot of now this is a tough one this is less, less of a beginner one is the walk and talks mm -hmm. get a lot of those and those you know i think why those are so important actually to work on outside of when you really just get them for an audition is because they're so difficult they're really hard and the people who do them do them really well and they stand out you know don't you guys agree i mean the walk mm -hmm. and talks where and i'm talking about the ones um you know where you're talking right to camera a little more of the spokesman type spokesman or sp spokeswoman type stuff um, I think those come up a lot and those people, you know, are And tough. a lot of times these days, they're not spokesperson. They're a uh, mom in a kitchen, just yeah. happens to be talking to camera. Like yes. they're, they're moving like away from that sort of spokesperson feel. And mm -hmm. it's just very conversational. But you just you get used to not making a lot of forward progress while you're walking. You know yes, what I mean? Yes, yes. Like the yes, movie not... walk, because we're like, okay, this is a, 30 second bit of dialogue, but you're gonna be walking from this corner of the room to that corner of the room. Mm -hmm. You'll get there way faster than you think. So slow that truck yeah, down. And our lighting and sound is all set up for you to stay <laughs> right there. Sometimes and, just like a like a step, yeah. or even just like a, a change of weight from one foot to is the all, other. Is all you need. And yeah. actually, um, Ava, with what you said, I do think it's super, super common where they write the most like business commercial dialogue heavy you've ever copy you've ever read and then they're like just make it natural yeah they're like this ain't natural <laughs> very like, conversational is, yes but to push against that and to try to make it as natural as you can like you said is such a great skill to have it's really really difficult absolutely um but but that's like one of the ways i think you can set yourself apart because it is you know tough to do well and i think people get so terrified of it and like first off we do absolutely everything we can in the room to make sure that you get the copy beforehand, you have the boards. I have uh, uh, casting directors who will put a hole in the board and then like right around the hole and put mm -hmm. it in front of the camera. Uh, I have a casting director who uses a teleprompter. And then I have actors like seasoned actors who come in using the teleprompter and they get freaked out by the teleprompter. Like there's something that happens to even the, the, the most trained actors that once they're talking to camera, freaks them out. Well, it's not just that. To me, it has everything to do with people being lazy. And it's the fact that when you have a lot of copy, which isn't a lot of copy, if you took the amount of copy you have in a commercial audition and translated that into a theatrical, you'd be like, oh, it's not a big enough part for me. <laughs> yeah, but then you get, you know, I want <laughs> then you put it in a commercial, it's like, oh my God, like how yeah. long is this spot? What yeah. are you guys doing? Do I yeah. need to? And so when you see a lot of copy, let's just call it a lot, even though I don't consider it a lot, unless it's many, many pages and we're having to pull up more than one sheet of paper for the boards, right? Mm -hmm. If it's just a substantial amount of text, people just don't know how to cold read very well. 
And cold reading is such an essential skill. And there's only one cold reading technique that I see works for everybody. Um, but there are other people who can get around using this technique because they just have a really good, I guess, they can look at the board in one second and pick whatever they need off of it and be able to deliver it all into the So what camera. is that technique? Well, so for me, that technique is very simple in terms of, uh, you know, connect and by connecting, meaning either with the person that you're talking to or with the camera, if it's something that's, you know, delivered to camera, like something that is spokesperson-y, um, is that, you know, we always see two, three or four words ahead of where we are at the moment, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to read a sentence smoothly. It'd be like, I went to the, you know, we see the words coming, which is why we can make it all smooth as we go. The problem is that most actors do the opposite of what they should. They want to be in camera or at the person from the beginning of the sentence, but then they forget the rest of the sentence as they go further along and then have to go away to the board or the sides by the time they get midway through the sentence or towards the end, which is rude. Because if I was talking to I said, hey, John, how are you? Then I turn away like I don't care about your answer. That's the equivalent. But if I'm fixing something like, oh, John, how are you? And then I give you my attention, you feel respected because I brought my attention to you. It's the very same thing when we're doing the cold reading and whether it's with sides or whether it's with the board. So what I share with people is read it off the board, but finish the thought of the sentence with the person or into the camera. And that way you're going up against a period or a piece of punctuation anyway, which means you're not memorizing anything. But it is so terrifying for performers to, they, they're going to feel like they're in the copy too much. And it, it, is, it is, you are in the copy too much if you're so distracted because you're trying to start every sentence with the person you're talking to that you're constantly going away into the copy. That's when we feel like you're in the page too much, right? But if you're actually just reading it and then bringing it to somebody and then reading it and bringing it to somebody, this is a first call. You do not need to be off book for this thing. You just need to have ease and be able to work with the text and not fumble and you know mess well, around with it. And I think that is the biggest thing. First of all, People get so scared of messing up the copy. That copy is going to change halfway through the audition. That copy is going to change three or four more times before you actually get to set. And then when you're on set, they're going to be making changes. So don't get so stressed about one sentence or one word here or there. And do not As, bail. Do not bail. Like get, just be there and be real. And if you end up having to paraphrase, whatever, I'd, I'd rather have a great take that has you paraphrasing the whole thing. And then, you know, we'll figure it out later to get like a, a word for word one if we need it. But I think, I think a lot of times people get freaked out about that, number one, and they forget that human beings don't stare straight at someone and never blink and never take a breath and just get through all of the lines as fast as they can and just keep talking and keep talking and don't know where their next thought is because they just are trying to get through all of the copy. Like that's not how human beings function. We we talk, we look away even in the middle of us in in our thought, we finish our thought and we think we're done. And then we get a new idea and that, you know, takes us somewhere else. So it's like it actually makes you look more like a human being if you use the board. I like to say, don't sacrifice the life for the line. No. Yeah, right. So they we will start doing never yeah. hire someone who got yeah. the words 100% right, but there's no but, life. But there's no life and no character. Mm -hmm. And they will always hire the person who brought a character to life, but didn't get any of the words right. They'll, they'll hire that one over the other one. Well, there, there's an interesting metric on dialogue, <laughs> which uh, there was a British study that played two uh, TED Talks to two groups of people that were on similar topics. One had 250,000 views and one had 12 million views, very similar. And they played a group of people, the audio and the video, and they paid people just a, a muted version of the video. And the response was the same. So it was the use of body language and how you connected with the audience. Mm. And the people who didn't hear one word had the same response. Did they like them? Did they trust the message? Did they wanna, you know, did they wanna see more mm. from that person? And without any dialogue, they still arrived at the same conclusion. Interesting, yeah. Which, which speaks to your point mm -hmm. about using your body. About using, and David, to your point, f first off, I love how you say about. I just, <laughs> I just like, I, I, I heard everything else, but, but, the, but I love about. Just throw more abouts in there. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, Out and about, those are the two words I can't exactly, lose. I'm sorry. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, but you're right. I tell everybody too, don't forsake the story for the words. If 
it were a matter of you being completely off book, then anybody with a didactic memory would be an Academy Award winner. And that's not the case. You've got to bring life to the story. You've got to bring that energy. Great note for people. I really hope that they were paying attention to that, that little lesson that you gave because it's so critical to be engaged. And I, like there was a, I think you were in the, in the, session I was running when I gave that very example that you did. Sometimes when I'm teaching or when not I'm teaching, but sometimes when I'm breaking down a scene in a, in a, in an audition, uh, you know, giving the, the group explanation, I will just key in on one person and I will explain everything to them, staring them in the face. And I'm not going to look away. And everything that I do is right there. And then after a while I say, you guys, if this were real life, you'd think I was a fucking lunatic. Mm -hmm. And yet we marry ourselves right into the camera and do that all the time. Yeah. So immediately you're bringing a false narrative to this. It also, you're making it harder on yourself. Like it, it's, it's easier and it looks better. <laughs> when you when you take pauses, when you go to the board to think of your next thought and then have a new thought and, and bring it to the camera. By the way, everybody listening, production, the director, the writers, nobody knows where we put the dialogue board. <laughs> yes. Okay? It is not an indictment on your ability as an actor to have to pull a line from the board. You are just thinking that direction. I see actors constantly, and I had it this week with a session where it was, uh, it was this Walmart job and there was a lot of movement and every line had an action. So the actors had to come in and be really off book or else it doesn't flow. And uh, I saw actors purposefully choosing to think their next thought away from the dialogue board. And then they were surprised when they didn't get it and we had to cut and reset and do it again. It's like, you guys, think. We look, we look away to pull our next thoughts. Use that board as where you think, trust me, your next thought is going to be there as opposed to the other side of the room. And yet it's like, nope, I'm a pro. I Ugh. should have this down. I don't need the dialogue board. Yeah, you do. And that doesn't mean you're not a pro. No. But I also think, you know, and this is something with, with storytellers we try to focus on. is like, what's your process? Like, what does it really take to like either buy a board or write it up mm -hmm. and have a camera and do it at home for a bit? I mean, I could talk to a hundred commercial actors, and I bet you 95 of them have never done that, mm -hmm. right? They've only done it in the audition room, which mm -hmm. is one place to learn, mm -hmm. but stealing yourself, getting, you know, so that you're ready for whatever when you go in there, that just takes some time and practice beforehand, you know what I mean? Or after rechecking back in. And I know? like when actors come in for the group direction, um, when there's like a board with a lot of dialogue and then they take a picture of the board mm -hmm. and then they go aside. Because for me, like I have a photographic memory. So if I've learned the lines Show off. I know <laughs> no but if I've learned <laughs> the lines yeah. um, on the piece of paper I know where this like this line this is the last word on this line and then it goes here and so that's what's in my brain when I'm when I'm reciting I'm like looking at it in my brain but then if it's in a totally different place on the board that can really throw me um, so then take a picture of it and then start learning it from the the what the actual board is because then that will stay in your brain. And if, you know, it, it may be hard. I think one of the reasons why more performers don't do what you just described, John, of like, go get a freaking big post-it pad and write up a script and like practice at home. Well, do it with a friend because then it makes it fun and you have somebody who can run camera and then it's something you're supporting each other on. Or if you don't want to do that, if you want to do it in a more formalized envir environment, then go to the conservatory and take one of you know, Ava's classes or one of Charles' classes or one of, one of the people who's teaching a free class at our union's conservatory where you can practice it there. You want to go more intense? Then sign up for a commercial class where you can actually like do a four or six week experience and get into that. There are ways to practice this because to me, the audition room is not the place for practice. Like I hate it when I hear actors say, I just want to get practice auditioning. It's like, no, 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 no. Our auditions do not exist for your practice. They exist for our clients to get what they need. And we have to judge you 
in comparison to everybody else that came in when you come in on one of our jobs, and if you're one of the worst people we saw that day just because you're trying to get practice, you just sacrifice the relationship with that office potentially, depending on how engaged the casting director was in reviewing the day or things like yeah. that. And I don't have time to teach you. Yeah. Like, that's why I teach a class, because then I can have time to teach you. But when I'm running a session, I don't have time for that. Yeah. I just have to get through my day. So you are getting the, the experience of having gone through an audition, which has educational properties, I suppose, but that's not the intended purpose of an audition. That is a professional opportunity. How do people find out about the free classes you mentioned? Well, if you are a SAG-AFTRA member, then you just go onto the SAG-AFTRA website under the Los Angeles Conservatory, and then you can find the full class schedule. It's $45 a year to be a member, and you can take as many classes as you want. There's 30 plus classes every single month. And I think um, you can enroll anytime now, you right? You can enroll anytime. Your, your membership's good for a year. This isn't really meant to be an ad for that. But the point is, if you are interested in like supporting your ability when you show up to do one of these things. You don't have to just sit at home miserable doing it yourself. Do it with a friend or get around other people where you can really be about the practice, not about jeopardizing a job. And to speak to the point you made earlier too of like actors cutting themselves, that drives me crazy. I'm sure it drives you guys crazy because sometimes there is, and this isn't just with like when it's you alone looking at camera, this sometimes happens in scenes too, but sometimes when you're doing a spot to camera or whatever, and it is going amazing. Like you're on fire, you're alive, whatever. And then you mess up like one word, doesn't matter. Like the rest of it is awesome. And then you cut yourself. Can't save that. I can't save it. I can't keep that take. I have to get rid of it. And it, I just want to like die for you in that moment because I'm like, you don't understand the brilliance. And it's like, okay, let's go again. And it might have been good and you might have gotten through it, but it wasn't the magic you'd had on that last take. And if I could have had that, that magic take where you flubbed a line and then we had a good take where you got all the words right, I could have kept both and I could have shown them how brilliant you were. But you you chose to cut yourself. And it's like, just trust that I've got your best interest. We in talked heart. about how much we're efficiency experts, right? We have yeah. to save time wherever possible. If we continue to roll past a flub you made, you have to assume it's for a reason because we are getting something of value. You're hearing from me, I will cut you if it's like going to be a waste of the time to keep going. And not only is it that the, you know, we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for the person for that role. And that's not just about whether all the words are correct. But sometimes when you do flub, you actually come alive in a way that you weren't when you're were trying to be so perfect. Yeah. And then we see the real person come through and we're like, there yes. you are. Those happy accidents. Right. Now, the other thing about apologizing, you said something that, you know, is a standard thing I say is not even bailing, but apologizing, commenting on it, you know, being hard on yourself, self-deprecating humor. Just stop. Yeah. Everybody who gets to listen to this, just stop all of that. The, the example I use is back in the days, there was something called a CD, compact <laughs> disc. Casting I remember because my no, there's a compact, <laughs> compact disc. And you used to have this little plastic disc that you would put into a playing device and then it would play music or audio, things Tell like that. Tell me moral, man. <laughs> That's right. Yes, back in the day. Now, when you would What's have... What's that boot? Okay, stop there it. There we go. Now, say there was a dance party or something like that and pe people had a CD player. Occasionally, a CD player might skip, either because of the vibrations in the floor or because there was a scratch on the disc, but you might have a skip. It, it, we, it's weird for that one little second, but then you get right back into the song like it never happened, no big deal. But if the CD player stopped and like, oh my gosh, you guys, I am so sorry I skipped. I promise this never happens. Duh. We'd be like, shut up and just keep playing the music. <laughs> Nobody cares. When you apologize and you start being self-deprecating, we start to worry about you. We start to think, is this person made of glass and they can't handle being on a set? They can't handle critique. They can't handle feedback or collaboration. You know, like if you can't keep your confidence and your, your composure together, then we can't trust you with being the lead on mm -hmm. a big project or something. So knowing that it's not about perfection, like just don't bail, don't start apologizing don't feel less than don't downward spiral everybody flubs because we're not robots yet <laughs> and I, I say that to, to little kids <laughs> when when kids have to come in and they have dialogue um, especially if they have a lot of it I always say to them before they come in the room it's impossible to do it a hundred percent right a hundred percent of the times because a lot of times with kids when they come in it's like they've practiced it they've practiced it and if they don't get it out 
right the first time, they are done. They think they've done something wrong. They think they've done something wrong, wrong, but then they can never get it out again. Like Mm -hmm. they can't move past it. And so I always tell them before they come in, like, you're going to, you're going to make a mistake. You're, you're not going to get it out right. That's totally normal. You can't, there's no way like mathematically, however you want to phrase it, but there's no way to, to do it perfectly every single time. So don't even worry about it. You actually look more professional getting through, like, you know, you flubbed the writer knows you flubbed. Everybody knows you flubbed the line, but if you have the poise, and the craft behind you to get through and just keep going and stay in the moment. It's like, yeah, I did it wrong, but like you said, yeah, man, but 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 look at him, he handled it. Yeah, that works. Yeah, that's what take two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 are for, you get it. And we flub in real life all the time. And, and how do we deal with it? Sometimes we stop and we continue. Sometimes we make a joke out of it. Sometimes, like, in depending on the spot and depending on who your character is, there's many ways to tackle a flub. You know, sometimes it means, you know, you've said the word, the see, I just did it. You say the word wrong and sometimes you, like, you can comment on it if that makes sense for your character. Uh, sometimes it's just about taking that pause and then just coming straight back into it, and we can cut, a, I mean, we as session runners can't cut around it, but they could in the edit cut around it. Totally, Jack has a really, uh, a great bit of advice that he gives because he works in the world of sound, and I've never forgotten it when he said this. You know, the advice that we ordinarily give a performer is that if you make a flub, stop, go back to the beginning of the line and start again. And that way we've got everything we need on one take. Jack takes it a step further and says, no, 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 Go back to the beginning of the line before the one that you flubbed so that we have a nice cut point if we needed to use that audio of the transition from one sentence to the next because you are in a natural flow of speak. So you were going from one sentence to the next and then you flub sentence number two. Well, don't go back to the beginning of sentence number two. Go back to the beginning of sentence number one so we have that nice transition. And that's really important on set, not just in an audition, but If we've only got time for one more take and then we have to break for lunch, we're losing daylight, whatever the case may be, if we don't get all of that on that take, even if we have to, you know, edit whatever, then we've just lost that line. And so you get it all in there because we don't have time to rebuild the barn and put the horses back and put the deal, rebuild the tower. Every every take has the material you need. There we go. Which is important. Although, you know, to your point, even seasoned professionals come in to do ADR or voiceover or added material for a film or TV show. And oftentimes they cut themselves Ugh. and, and uh, so, so, you know, yeah. we go through the same thing all the time. I think we, we, we're so scared of, um, that we're not perfect mm-hmm. and like, but no one is perfect. And, and, you know, you talked about, um, laziness, but I saw like, oh, I did this teleprompter, um, session not too long ago where all these women had to come in and, and use the teleprompter. And the, some of these women were like theatrical pros, like they didn't even do commercials very often. Some of them are people that come in regularly for me. And the fear mm. that they had, that they were they couldn't deal with a teleprompter, they didn't know how to do it. Um, they were so afraid of messing up. They And then sometimes they would still get the words wrong. And I was like, the teleprompter works for you here. I can change the speed. If it's too slow for you, if it's too fast for you, like you don't have to chase it. Mm-hmm. You, you are in control of all of this. And and you just tell us what you need to fix it. But instead they would get so apologetic that they weren't fast enough or they weren't this or that they messed up this one line and it's right there. They should have known better. And it was just like, no, just come in and deliver the character. That's what's important. And we will adjust everything else to make that work for There's you. There's a phrase we have in the studio that's you are enough. Mm-hmm. And it really is profound and it's amazing how much people resist it and it takes a lot of time to really understand what that really means fully how that means and what that means is that that's who we are engaging that's who we want to hire is you you know not your performance even we're hiring you your performance gives us a chance to see your behavior how you laugh how you smile how you talk how How you you take direction right but right at at the end of the day we're looking for you 
And the people that we're choosing to call in or the people that the casting directors we work for are choosing to call in are saying, okay, this role is so John and so Mike and so Steve. And they're going to know like 20 people immediately that, that, that who you are as a human being is a really close fit to what they're looking for for this. And then when you come in and show your performance, it's going to filter through all these, uh, these instruments and we're going to get all these options and things like that. But ultimately, it is you we're looking for. So don't let the performance override the fact that we just want to spend time with you and get to see you tell this story with us. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, that's really good. It's funny. And I totally agree with that. Sometimes I do say in my classes, I say, you are enough, but sometimes you're not enough. And what I mean by that is I think the attitude or mentality towards work and hard work before the auditions come, uh, can be improved. So mm-hmm. I do think they are enough, but my point with that you is- You still like, have to do the work. <laughs> see, that's the thing. And if someone's like, well, I'm gonna go in there to a commercial and be who I am, uh-huh. you still have to do the work. That's, mm-hmm. that's my point with, yeah. with that phrase. Because I also think a lot of times, and this applies a little more to theatrical, but also commercials, people think for like a theatrical, the, the work they put in two days before is gonna get them the job. And I always say, no, no, no. it's the six months before. That's going to prepare you for well those two said. days before. Do you know what I'm saying? Because well it's like, said. oh, I've got eight pages. I've got to learn in two days. I'm going to put in all this work. I'm going to learn the British accent. I'm going to do it. It's like, no, no. If you haven't been preparing that six months before, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about walk-in talks with commercials too, but also theatrical stuff, that's the seeds that then when you get it the two days before, you're ready to come in at a high enough level. Gosh, that's, right? that's the gold right there that mm-hmm. I hope people keep rewinding and listening to this because you don't know when your next big opportunity is going to come. And sometimes the phone doesn't ring for a while or the, uh, you know, the, the, the auditions don't come in and you, that's that place where you start to wonder, well, what am I, what am I doing here? Well, let me ask you, what are you doing? Yeah. Are you working every day? Like in the classes we teach, I always tell, I always tell the students, you guys, I'm, I, I honor and respect the fact that in LA, you can do a thousand different things on any given night. And instead, Mondays and Wednesdays for me, you guys are here working this craft, getting it so that when you do get that call, it's not, oh shit, I got eight pages. It's, ah oh, shit, I got eight pages. Mm-hmm. Because you have conditioned yourself and it all, the walk and talk, all these little things, it's amazing. You play in as Sean, you play the guitar and you play it very, very well. If you only played the guitar one day a week when you went to take guitar lessons, it would take you 18 years to be able to play something that that is recognizable. Musicians play every day because they love to do it. Yet we as actors tend in this beautiful craft, this art that we say that we love so much, we don't do it except for when we pay to go to class or when we go to audition to practice auditioning. How many times do you practice a job interview? I just wanna, I just wanna go on some job interviews to get experience practicing job. No, you wanna go on those interviews to get the job. Mm-hmm. And that's what this is. So at least for me, and I say start off simply. Start off the habit. And I, in, in the, in the uh, conservatory class, I challenge everybody this. And of all the classes I taught, I think there were only four people who took me up on it. I said, read aloud 10 minutes a day for the next 15 days. And if you do that, at the end of 15 days, I'll go out and take you out for a cup of coffee and we can talk. And I've had of the hundreds of people that came in, four. Four took me up on that. A Ten chance minutes to a spend time with the sexy Charles. I know. <laughs> I know. And I'm, How many pages oh, do you, are you have to read? And, and, you know, and, and, and I'm smiling. I'm not even just sitting there brutish and intimidating looking. I'm smiling. I'm doing, <laughs> but that's the thing. Start off small. And now, as look, as a pro actor, I get it. Like, Leslie Kahn has a spend 35 hours a week doing your stuff. I wish I had 35 hours a week to dedicate to this, but I have two kids and a wife who take up a lot of time and... I have other things, but I will always, always carve out at least an hour where I'm reading copy, where I'm doing something, just to not to book I, the part. What, what I, what, one of the, I mean, I think we there's different analogies for it, but the one I always like is like a plant. 
which is like if you water it on one day for like five hours, it ain't going to grow exactly. 10 feet tall, right? Exactly. You've got to water it. you got to take care of it every day. And to mm-hmm. me, I see that as your acting craft, similar to what you're saying. And, you know? and the thing is, too, is like if you are putting that kind of effort in, then when you get to the audition and you just get thrown all this information about it, you can filter it through mm-hmm. much more easily because you've been going to the gym. And then when you get into the room, you can throw it all away in a sense and you can just be in the moment you've been going to the gym because yeah. the thing it's is, not everybody there. is getting you know three four auditions a week so you know as long as you're working out and immersed in storytelling on a consistent basis then the one time you get an audition in a week or two or three or whatever it is for you you're not putting all of your hopes and dreams and your artistic expression into one experience that's probably not going to be very fulfilling because we might have well you come said. in and just yeah. say what's your name what are you doing this weekend next yeah. like you know but, like it's not gonna but be. i will say and and, you know, theatrical is great and all, and I totally 100% agree with what you guys are saying, um, but because we're talking commercials here today, I, and I know it's a lot of money, and I know we have like 100,000 things on our, on our plate, but commercials are different from theatrical. And I sometimes feel like they're treated a little bit like the redheaded stepchild. And you have to take commercial classes. Like, you have to focus on things from the commercial point of view too, because if you're just going and taking theatrical classes and then expecting that to translate over to commercials, it doesn't work the same way. And then you're not prepped for what you need to be bringing into those commercial it's auditions. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, part of it is that the way we tell stories has evolved where there, it only used to be on stage. Then we started getting into, I mean, there's other things like, you know, dance is a way to tell stories and singing is a way to tell stories. But if we talk about, you know, acting in terms of telling stories like with stage work, well, now we have on camera, but not all on camera work is the same. You know, you wouldn't say, okay, just because I took a high school drama class that I can suddenly do motion capture or just because I took a really great, you know, improv class that now I can do scripted television or something. It's like you need to have uh, specificity in your training as as well. And I agree with you. People tend to look down on commercials, even though it's where you're going to make the bulk of your money before your theatrical career takes off. Or at least that's how it's used by a lot of people, because we didn't probably move across the country to just do commercials. We came here to do storytelling and TV and film. I feel like and I don't know if it's still the same, but I once looked at the um, SAG pie for what SAG pie for what people got paid and it was broken by film tv and commercials and i feel if i remember right commercials was more than uh tv and film combined well, it's yeah. a billion dollars of so, income you know, into if you, our if you, union if you do need yeah. to you know find ways to, to pay your bills and stuff that's a more realistic way especially but, but that billion out. dollars is spread out more amongst the middle class of performer the reason why we don't know more on the theatrical side of why it seems smaller is because we only get contributions up to a certain cap so if somebody pays you $20 million for a film, it's only the first quarter of a million that is reported to the union that oh. you get contributions on. So the other, you know, $19.75 million, <laughs> we don't have a, a, a record of because it's only, it's our, our you know, contributions are capped. So there's, there's more money, but it's going to the highest earning performers, whereas the middle class is what's earning the commercial stuff yeah. other than some celebrity campaigns, things like that. But the vast, vast majority of performers you see in commercials are middle class performers like us. Yeah. And they're, they're working. They're, they're paying their bills. They're feeding their families. They're paying their health insurance, like mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff from commercials and theatrical. But commercials are a huge bulk of that. And I, I mean, I love commercials so much. Um, that's just really where I've like focused my time now because I think there's so much to to do with them. There's so much that can be fulfilling about them. But I do find that people don't necessarily get them right away. And even people who are training theatrically and going out on you know TV auditions and whatever, they don't always know how to translate that into commercials. And I think that's really important that if you're going to go on commercial auditions, that you really start to understand how they work. And get training on those. All right, let's go back to a couple other things and then keep getting through the workflow of our our jobs. One of them is working with partners. Mm -hmm. Right, so sometimes you get paired up and you may not get the partner that you wish you would have gotten because they're not as attractive or they're not as skilled or whatever Funny. the case may be. It works that way in life, too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those of you who are arranged totally marriage. Totally a little more cellular than that. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you guys recommend uh, people handle if they're not satisfied for whatever reason with the partner that they've been given? Well, I think one of the things that I always say is, because um, I talk about this actually uh, a lot, um, is I was, I was quoted as... Um, working with babies and people that suck. Um, but it, it's, it's, 
<laughs> this sense of um, if you're at all familiar with improv, when you're doing improv, the best way to be a good improvising partner is to support the other person and not make it about you. Uh, and so anytime you start trying to, and you talked about this a little bit, John, of like when you're in like a group of like five that are improvising and everyone's trying to get their funny line in there, it just becomes this like butting of heads and this aggression of fighting as opposed to just relaxing and taking care of the other person. And if you can show we can see it all. We can see the person who's going crazy or who's just throwing stuff out there and, and taking all of the air in the room. Um, so if you can show that you can still support that person and you can still be there and be present in the scene and in your character, our attention will actually go to you. There's an audition that I had um, for, and it's a commercial that I booked last fall, a pharmaceutical commercial. And uh, the reason why I was cast in that commercial, because I'm not a good, I mean, they want a basketball player, hire John Ruby, you know, but for me, I booked a commercial. <laughs> I booked a commercial playing pickup basketball with the guy for, you know, for a pharma thing. And the reason the director said that they hired me was because I made everybody else more comfortable, but you know, it was clear that I was the person that was supportive and building everybody up. And for the, the real person who was a real person afflicted with this condition, that was the, the kind of the lead in the, in this spot, they knew that I would put him at ease and that would make him feel good. And that, you know, so I was hired not because I'm the best basketball player, cause I'm not. But I was, you know, good enough at being able to be believable as somebody who's just playing with buddies at a park. Yeah. But you know, I was hired because I made other people better when I was there. And the thing is, is that you need to trust us because, again, our job is to make the actors look as good as possible. Literally, our job depends on it. We will not continue getting hired. So trust that I'm getting what I need out of you. And sometimes you go in there with a person who is terrible, but we got to see enough of you that I'm pretty confident you're going to get a call back. And you may feel like, oh, I just got railroaded or that, that partner sucked or whatever, whatever. And sometimes you'll ask if you can do it again. And if I feel that you absolutely like we just could not see it, I will always try and like just stay back. I'm going to let that person go and I'll, I'll bring in another partner for you. But most of the time I can see what you're bringing and it doesn't matter. That per the other person's not getting a call back. Don't worry. They're not going to be there next time. Um, but, you know, you will be. And I think it's like trusting that we are seeing that and, and that if you ask and we say, no, you can't go again, also trusting that we're doing that for your benefit. It's a partnership. It's yeah. your audition. It's our session. Yeah. Now, another technical thing that you can be working on, that's one of the ways that commercials can be different, is that we oftentimes have a lot of different eye lines of where things are going on in the room, right? So we're going to put tape up on the wall over here. This is what's going on over there. Here's some tape over here. Put your eye line for that over there. You know, and so if you're not used to working with splitting your points of focus like that, you're going to do that in commercial auditions. Like, it's just going to happen. Um, so another reason to get a friend, all that stuff, work on that is to build your willingness to buy in to playing to a piece of tape on the wall, even if it's your mom or it's your wife or. Well, and that goes to my, my, my working with babies section is, um, sometimes you go in with a kid who just is like frozen, like will not give you anything. And I have seen people completely forsake their entire audition because they spend the whole time trying to get the kid to react, trying to get the kid to do what they're supposed to do. And I always look at it as like, you got to let that kid drown because that kid's not going to... Just I mean, metaphorically. Metaphorically <laughs> and literally. No, I'm just saying. No, um, sometimes you got to call the hurt. Okay? You got to call. Just, just, but, just, but, like, no, let's no, be, yes. but let's be truthful. Like yeah. that kid, if they can't get the, the one line out, they're not going to get a call back anyway. They're not going to book the job. So why are you throwing your audition away mm -hmm. for the kid who's not going to get it anyway? And so sometimes you have to treat them like that piece of tape or whatever. You just have to pretend they're doing what they're doing and just, you know, make believe they're, you know, the dinosaur in Jurassic Park as opposed to the tennis ball and, and, and still stay in the moment. And I think people, I've seen that happen so often where people just completely bypass their entire audition because they were so focused on the kid and trying to be a good person. Like I get it, you know, they're trying to do a good job, but it's kind of our job, I think, to try and get the performance out of the child. And if we can't get it out of them, 
we'll say the kid's line. Yeah. We'll bring in another kid. We'll, mm. we'll, that's our job. Don't, as the actor, focus on that. It's your job to go in there and bring you. Okay, so group and party auditions, right? Where you bring in a bunch and you're like, you're at a party and you're just talking, right? So you're just making up dialogue and improvising with each other. Tips for people are like common traps that we see in that type of audition. Don't insult other people and think that that is going to be, uh, that is disguised as really good witty improv, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't put other people down. If you're going to say something insulting, aim it at yourself. We laugh at ourselves. Oh yeah, that was funny, yeah, I do that too, okay. But if I'm in a scene and I'm going to say some sort of biting comment at you because I think that the, the writers and everybody, the ad agency is gonna be like, watch me, watch what I do, this is a zinger. It just, it undercuts you and it makes you look like an asshole. And assholes don't move product unless the spot has been written for a character to be the foil, yeah. okay? Also, just like what John did, understand where you are in the scene. Understand that we are watching you and if you're hunting for attention, you look needy and desperate. John booked that part because he's a great actor and I'm sure he was very calm in the room and he saw everybody else fighting for their stuff. So what did he do? He just changed his vibe and started focusing his attention somewhere else. On the story. Yeah. If everybody else is so engaged in their lives that they're not, they're not actively moving what the story is, then they're going to get called out. But, you know, sometimes, again... Just a look, just looking and listening, giving a good laugh, you know, just it's the, it's the what I was less say, that you do. Yeah, what yeah. I was going to say is I, what, I, what I tell students and what I try to do is, um, especially when it's like a party scene, is try to find a connection with that other person. Yes. Right? <laughs> so it's asking, it, it, sometimes you can build it beforehand, right? Oh, have you taken any trips lately? Oh, you went to Iceland. I've always wanted to go. Or I've Ask been. a real question. Right, it's a real question. And then when you're in there, it's less of like, are you going hiking? I'm going hiking too. And yeah. I'm like, oh God. Uh, it's more like a real connection about something you're actually interested in. And, you know, that can be really fun and interesting and very, you know, quote unquote real, but in the sense of you've are, you, you're building a connection, which is what we want to see, right? Versus faking a connection. Yeah, it's again, it's, it's like what we were talking about with the boards. It's a cheat that actually works better mm -hmm. and somehow people have this weird thing of like we have to we're acting we have to like make everything up we yes. have to work so yeah. hard it's like it's actually sometimes easier yeah. to do the thing that looks better on camera on yeah. a technical note don't start the scene at the start of yes. your question yes, aren't yes. you enjoying this party where we all are <laughs> gathered tonight oh, hi God, sister oh. <laughs> yeah. look just like you said talk about iceland yeah. when the camera starts to roll continue that conversation. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, once I know it's a party scene, they're going to start rolling eventually. Yeah. Let's just let's keep talking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's just let's keep on talking. And there's something weird that some actors do is where they talk really quiet or whisper to each other or they just mouth like they're talking mm -hmm. but they don't actually Because yeah, they're talk. really scared. Mm -hmm. They're so scared of being heard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, are, why are you mouthing? I, just talk. Yeah, I was I was running this session the other <laughs> day where um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, where they it, all they had to do was it was f uh, three people sitting at a desk like side by side and they all they're doing is working. And the these two are like working and maybe interacting a little bit, the other person's on the phone. And it was so funny to watch the people who were very confident just, and I was like, you never get off the phone. You're just on the phone the whole time. And I'm panning and zooming in on certain people, different times, whatever. The people who could just have a conversation and about whatever, it didn't matter, but they were able to like keep the sound going and make it into something. And then there were the scared ones who were on the phone, but they did this the whole, th well, I can't do it over on a podcast, but just like <laughs> mouthing <laughs> and, and never saying anything out loud. And, and so their face was still doing stuff. So it was okay, but they, you could just see and realize like how afraid they were. We're wired for sound. Yeah. Mime talking never works, never. It has never worked in any audition I've run. Mm -hmm. It will never work in any audition that I'm going to run. Unless we're looking to cast a mime, don't mime talk. That's why <laughs> That's why when it's an improvised scene, we allow you to talk even though there's not going to be dialogue in the spot. Yeah. Because it yeah. makes you normal. I was also, you know, one of the things um, we talked about kind of cutting yourself in a walk and talk. But another thing I would just throw out there that maybe most people are aware of, but don't end your own scene 
and then look at us or the camera. <laughs> right? Because yes. that does happen, right? So with the phone call, it's like, did yeah. I do enough? It's like, no, no, just stay in the world. Yeah. And, and because that's sometimes when the best stuff happens, if you just stay in that world, stay in the world, and then let us say, okay, great, perfect. Yeah. Right? So that's If I haven't cut yet, if like the script has ended yeah. and I still haven't cut, there's a reason. Yeah. So just stay in the scene, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We all want auditions and we want to be there, yet it's amazing how quickly we want to get the fuck out of the audition. <laughs> stay in character. Just stay in the room. It won't be forever. Yes. Because mm -hmm. you, you want to have gone to the audition. You want to have spent as little time in that room as possible and done everything perfect so you can just get the job. As opposed Which is to so spending silly. time living I, in the story. I always say, like, that's my favorite thing is to go into that audition because it meant I got to act today. It meant I got to play yeah, today. So, to so on the mouthing point, mm -hmm. you know, when you bring in wall group actors to fill a scene, you know, on location, all of your extras in the background at a crime scene or whatever are mouthing. Yes. Because they're only interested in principal character dialogue. Mm -hmm. So when you get new actors coming in for that commercial audition, if they think they have to do a background party scene, they might just be doing what they've been told to do on set because they don't understand the yes. difference between I, the I two experiences. Say, I totally agree. And, and, and to your point, when you're shooting wall, if you're doing a police scene or that kind of stuff, when the beeps come in, you, know, you get three beeps and then four, you're in a cord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The good actors start well before the beep so that when you're in to record, you're in the yeah, scene. Same. They're not starting with, you know, right on the scene, as you said. And same thing, they keep going until you're at a record. They don't stop at the end of the queue. They keep right. going. And, and, and so it, it feels much more organic. That way. But mm -hmm. that also goes to the point of why you need to train in all of the different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Because one thing might work and you need to do it for this mm -hmm. and it's something totally well, different. Well, let's right talk here. about one of the most basic things, which is that. You know, whether you're background or principal, you're not usually told to look into the camera. So just having the, you know, the instruction that you're going to be delivering this to camera is a big enough jarring thing for a lot of performers because yeah. they're not used to breaking that fourth wall. Mm -hmm. And so unless you're practicing that at home, but even if you're practicing it at home, it's a little different when you've got lights in this, you know, you got this, you know, session director behind the camera, like talking to you. Um, like that's really useful is just to practice personalizing and talking to the camera so that you're comfortable with it. I have, every time I teach a commercial class, I have the students come up and embrace, literally embrace the camera, hug the camera and the board because people are so scared of the board. I'm like, these are your friends. They love you. They're here to help you get employed. Like, let's not be scared of them. You know, they're just as scared of you as you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I find when I'm doing those, like, uh, writ to camera jobs, like, I'll hide behind my computer a little bit more so mm -hmm. that they don't see me, so mm -hmm. that they can almost kind of pretend that they're in, like, their own world. Yeah. Um, so that it doesn't feel like I'm staring at them while they're staring at the camera and they get all self-conscious about it. I do want to say something, and I know it feels a little superficial after we've been talking about the performance and stuff, but I have been noticing a lot of lately is um, clothing choices. Mm -hmm. And they really can make or break things. And I think people need to be really aware of, and maybe it's more of a thing for, for women than for guys, but really aware of th their clothing reflects the character. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing a, a real rise of um, shirts that don't um, that that cut here that don't have straps and stuff mm. like that. So when we take their thumbnail pictures, they Looks look like naked. naked. Nice. Um, <laughs> That was Charles. <laughs> Charles doesn't even believe that. That's the thing. Um, and then also. Um, Belly shirts. Mm -hmm. There seems to be an influx of those, and I've had a couple People of. People want to show you, their belly. Are you talking to Sean right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, this is a this is um, all for Sean. <laughs> um, no, but I, but I've had a couple of those happen, and one in particular where the ad agency people were in the room, and they were like, "Do you have a jacket? Because we love what you're doing, but." Our client is in the Midwest, and they're very conservative, and they're not going to like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought. There was no reason in yeah. your character for you to have your entire midriff showing. Mm -hmm. And I've I've seen a couple of those things happening very recently. And I thought, like, there needs to be some thinking. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, like, <laughs> the other day, sometime this week, uh, I was outside the room explaining. And I had the director in the room. And it was like a family. And I'm telling them, you're a family. You're eating din to get dinner together, all this stuff. And as I'm talking, the the woman is like, oh, and she takes her shirt, like her her um, denim shirt off, and underneath she's got this tiny, tiny, like red strappy dress with like the zipper up the whole way, like it was like such a cocktail dress, and I was like, 
no, put that shirt back on. Like mm -hmm. now you so look inappropriate for the job, but with the shirt, it looked, you know, mm -hmm. fun and kind of like momish. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, really? And she was so surprised. And I thought like, there's this disconnect here where people need to understand this is what I need to be wearing. This is because we're, yes, we're wired for sound, but visually we're going to see that and instantly know who you are. Totally. And if you're not dressing appropriately for the job you're coming in for, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And if you're saying, put some, some real quick, put some thinking into it, you yeah. can also put no thinking into it. And all you have to do is go to iSpot, watch a couple other commercials in that same vein or from that yeah. same company mm -hmm. and just pull those clothing that they're wearing. I mean, yeah. so I'm saying you could yeah. think it or you could just say, that's what they're casting. That's the world. Yeah. I'm just going to copy that. And if people don't you know? believe it's that, easy. I'm running a call back yesterday, I heard the director say, I really liked what she did, but unfortunately she wore the wrong clothes today. And wow. that was the last we heard from her. Yeah, they may not have an imagination or, you know, know that, you know, the, the clothes can completely change their perception of you. Another thing is, you know, I had to give the advice to a friend of mine a long time ago where she would come into every audition like dressed to the, like, to the nines like she would be so super glammed out because she was more of like a model type and all that and i'm like dude you know how many times i've heard a director or somebody like say like she's just inaccessible i'm like you've got to like tone all that crap down like this is commercials this isn't freaking vogue or something or, or james like, bond girl you know what i mean yeah. in the sense of like yeah. you know or like that type of unless that's what you're going in yeah, for right yeah. but just like yes, you know as, yes, soon, yes, as soon as she yeah. started wearing flats like normal nice clothes but just like not flashy and like not less makeup and all that stuff she started like booking way more it's like you know again put some thought into your appearance yeah. and how that's going to affect the, that's, the story that's so surprising because when i've done like beauty campaigns where it's all just models coming in and they're coming in as like moms mm -hmm. and they all come in and they're like five inch heels ripped jeans the hair that like they just rolled right out of bed and i was like you what you what is going on here mm -hmm. you look like you partied last night and then just mm -hmm. like threw an old t-shirt on just to run over here and i i think you know it, with this world, obviously, yeah, we talk a lot about the craft, which is great, but there is kind of this instant feedback people get. And, and I always think about, I was helping cast a thing where they wanted a, a, a swimmer and they brought in an Olympic swimmer and she didn't book the part. Someone else looked more like an Olympic swimmer than the a real <laughs> Olympic swimmer. You see what I'm saying? So like to yeah. me, I was like, that was really interesting, right? So someone else looks more like an Olympic swimmer than a real Olympic swimmer. Like that's kind of where it's like, a little messed up in a certain sense. Yeah. But the reason is also, when I mean, you think about how quick commercials are, we don't have time to go to the whole backstory or explain this relationship or explain mm -hmm. this person. Mm -hmm. We need to kind of get that instant grab. So you need to yeah. think about that with clothes. I think the same thing of that kind of instant grab. Well, John, you hit the nail on the head. You've been hitting the nail quite well today. Thank you. Um, I, think I drink coffee, so. Okay, so boom, so good. Uh, the eye spot, the taking a moment to do your due diligence. Again, we all teach at the, at what we teach at storytellers is take your time to pregame, to do your work, to understand if you're going in for a show or a commercial, whatever it is, watch a couple episodes in that vein, see what it is. And you said something really interesting that people treat commercials like the redheaded stepchild. Yeah. I like redheads. They're really cool. I never understood <laughs> that. But the, the thing is, it's true. You come in and even your energy, your demeanor, your professionalism on the day coming into the commercial, it's almost an afterthought. Well, yeah, it's commercial audition, so I'm going to come in and hit it. And to that end, I had an actor, and I'll tell you guys after we wrap who he is. We've all seen him. We all know him. He works a ton. This, this job that I did just two days ago, every action, every line had an action. And everything had to flow. There could be no hems and haws and stuttering. It just, it was a continuous chain of thought. And if you will, if you had done your homework, because uh, Jody had sent the sides out earlier, if you've done your work, everything was ready to go and you come in and you hit it. This actor just didn't have it. And I was like, oh, he's so funny. He normally, he's, he's right on. And he said to me, yeah, afterward. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm sorry. After I'd burned six or seven takes trying to get him there and it just, didn't work and there was one average one that I had to use because it hurt the other guy who is the friend who just has a line and then is is reactionary. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm not, they they live on the tape, but th that was the take. And he's like, yeah, it's just kind of an aside, a ha ha, yeah, I guess I shouldn't have spent my time in the lobby talking about uh, politics as opposed to working on this. Yeah, you shouldn't have because you wasted your time, but moreover, 
and that you wasted my time mm -hmm. and and the other actors time and the other actors time but now i have to catch up and i was trying to be nice because i know what you can do mm -hmm. and it's it's that matter of professionalism like you said taking the time to do the walk and talk at home to put up the dialogue board to go on iSpot and to find out what it looks like they were supposed to be camping some guys walked in in a t-shirt and jeans like they were just hanging out on a, and yeah i get it you can wear a t-shirt and jeans camping but that immediate moment like you were saying i have to know who you are right away see that foley see what i did that snap that was all me <laughs> i came up with that on the spot uh that's all the improv training you guys um <laughs> Being able to read that immediately, the guy with the flannel or the vest or like, and, oh, camping, got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're just like, you're not even trying. Yeah. You know, and it, and it reads and it's very apparent. And I do think sometimes it actually comes from fear of people are scared of commercials because they don't understand them. And so it's easier for them to just be like, You're so generous. Nah. I'm like, lazy, you're lazy people. No, but, I've, but I have had that and I've had that like, <laughs> I, I've I've had people talk to me. Maybe it's more women who are able to like you know sort of share that with me. But um, I have had people talk to me about that in my classes where I've been like, yeah, I, I you know where I'll say like I think people are you know treat it like a redheaded stepchild and I love it and whatever. And they're like, no, I love commercials, but I'm so afraid of them. Like I I get theatrical. I understand how it works. I don't understand how commercials work, and so it's easier for me to just not do them. Mm -hmm. Or you know I try oh, every once so in a much while. Income everything giving that away right well if you guys aren't doing the things that you're hearing you know then hopefully you're learning some things you should do to increase your chances of success within commercials and and you should also not be complaining so much about not booking commercials if you're not doing some of these things because what we're just going to give you commercials without having to work to earn them that's not <laughs> how things work okay let's keep moving through the flow yeah okay so at the end of your audition by the time you're almost walking out the door with all your crap that you hopefully put by the door so you didn't have to spend a bunch of time <laughs> grabbing it from the the back of the room, your audition is probably already live. Now, that doesn't mean the client is going to see it right away because they're going to get the client link at the end of the day when we've rearranged people. And so something that people may not be aware of is that, you know, not only do we get to choose which takes we want to keep of yours and we can switch the order of those, but at the end of the day, no matter what the order is of the people who came in, we can rearrange the order. We can put groups together. If you have people coming at different times that are supposed to be part of like all the moms or all the dads, we can move their things around. Generally, we have casting directors want us to put some of our favorite choices mm -hmm. near the top so that the clients don't start watching the tape, you know, the takes and start freaking out that everybody sucks right, right off the, at the gates. So like, let's start them strong. Yeah. <laughs> put your, whoever your favorite ones, make that the, put them at the top of the link. Mm. There's a, another industry term we use called franking, where, you know, it's, it's not always responsible for us to present your audition to the clients because either they'll think less of us for presenting that performer as, a, as an option, or it was just so bad or it was just unprofessional where we can't present you as a human being to the client. Yeah. You may be a good actor, but we know you're, you were a nightmare when you came in. Or, or the third one, I've worked with a casting director who, who works with kind of a big time uh, like film director and she, her job is to really call the herd for him mm -hmm. so we see 40 people and she wants to reduce it down to six yeah mm -hmm. you know well, that's I mean? theatrically they do that a lot they do theatrically but i'm saying i do this for commercial oh okay right i'm saying even for commercial I've wow. had that. yeah 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 you know so so sometimes i've had that where casting directors are like we don't want to present we don't want to overwhelm we really want to like you know narrow it down narrow it down so exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking mm -hmm. about even even to the extreme almost what I'm yeah saying, which was surprising. yeah that's that is unusual in commercials yeah. for and sure we can do a lot of repair at the end of the day if we need to trim yeah. takes or if we need to fix like images like those times where we take a photo and you were blinking and we didn't realize it so we have to go later and like find a still from the actual well, and also sometimes and this goes to like headshots if you were brought in based on your headshot and and we can see your headshot when we bring you up in the computer and then we take that thumbnail picture that replaces it. And so there's been times where I know what the spot is supposed to look like. I know what the, the category that that actor type is supposed to look like. And then you come in the room and I'm like, what were they thinking when they mm -hmm. they brought that person? In? And then I see their headshot and I'm like, oh, they were bringing your headshot and they were not bringing you in. <laughs> and at the end of the day, that might get you franked because mm -hmm. you're just so not right um and i have been seeing 
that mm-hmm. um, a fair amount recently. Yeah, I think there's an idea of like, I want my headshot from when I was 20 pounds lighter or yeah. when I was 10 years younger, whatever. And it's it's much better if you just look like your headshot, yeah. whether it's glamified and you're a model or not, but it's more like it looks like you. It looks like because you. Because we need all different types. And especially like I find with guys these days, like it's like their headshots, them a little bit le- a little bit thinner, but also look more cleaned up, like no beard, mm. shorter hair. And then they come in and like their hair's long, they got a scruffy beard. And I'm like, so the takeaway is push that extra piece of cheesecake away from yourself, you fat ass. <laughs> or have the cheesecake and then go out and get new headshots. <laughs> One of the two. I'm just saying there's your choice. Or exercise. <laughs> just look like your headshot. Uh, and eat what you want. How important are headshots? They are very important in the sense that you need to, you need to have headshots and you need to have them on your LA Casting and Casting Frontier profile. You need to have like four, I think is a good safe number to have um, because that is the only thing sometimes that the casting director gets to see because uh, for you know your resume in commercial world is not the same as it is theatrically so we're not looking to that as much really what we're looking to is your picture and maybe your training so it has to look like you because again as we were talking about 30 second spot we have to instantly know who you are when we see you on on camera so so much is about what you look like um, before you even open your mouth sometimes. So if a casting director is going through 5,000 submissions and she gets to choose 10 to come in, she's got to pick the ones that look appropriate for the part. And if your headshot does not resemble you, you've wasted your time, her time, my time, like everybody's time. Yeah. And there's four main categories that I recommend to people, and that is to have a casual look, like how you would go to... Home Depot on the weekends or going out to a baseball game or something like that, like nice and comfy, casual. That that ticks so many boxes for jobs. Then we have a phrase called upscale casual, which is more like premium brands, like nice you know, luxury cars or financial things or that kind of thing. And I say however you would dress to a nice dinner party or church or something like that would probably be your upscale casual. Then you have your business casual. So now you're taking a step into having like a nice collared shirt and dress pants or something like that, loose tie, something that really reads like you are like an everyday employee of a nice place. Then your business professional, that's your suits. That's when you're like the doctor, the CEO, the, you know, any kind of real professional, you know, those four categories should pretty much knock off most of what you're going to do commercially. And, and what I, I talk about is, um, a lot is if trying to figure out who your essence is and knowing who you are, because uh, like I had a, a woman in my class the other day and, and she was, um, she had just gotten new headshots and I told her her headshots weren't that great. And she was like, but I just got them. And uh, I was like, but they're not showing you. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, my photographer said I should, you know, bring some mom clothes. And I'm like, cool, but what does that mean to you? Because your mom is very different than my mom is very different than this, like, 25-year-old over here mom is going to be. And so it's, you know, if you're not the kind of office person who would ever wear a suit, then don't make that, like, don't go and buy a suit because it's never going to look right on mm-hmm. you. Then have a cardigan. Then have, uh, a sh- if you're a guy, a, sh- a, bit, a button-up shirt but no tie or a loosened tie. Like, mm-hmm. figure out what it looks like for you. I always say, like, start as your base is what's your favorite piece in your closet right now that you like to wear that's your casual that's your thing that you love and then have something that's a little lower than that have something that's a little higher than that um and then you can kind of you know play from there when you say lower that's higher you're more advice. dressy less dressy yeah like yeah. you know you've got that at home casual that like you know you're just going to run to the store maybe um then you've got that you know maybe you got to make sure you look nice and you're just going to run out. And then depending on who you are, maybe you're the type of type of person who as a woman, like never leaves the house without like full layer of makeup. Well, then maybe you're going to have a little bit more of like a glam Mm -hmm. shot. Maybe you're a little bit more edgy. Well then have uh, an edgier shot. So what I would say for that, and that's maybe a category I'd I'd add to what Sean's, which which are great. I think those are great. Is just like a special skill photo. And Mm -hmm. what I mean is like, if you're a great great skateboarder and it doesn't have to be a pro photo. You don't need professional photos of that. If you're a biker, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I would just, I would have that up on LA casting. If you're a juggler, along with a skill clip, you know, just somebody shot you on an iPhone. I think that is a great, besides those, Four base foundations, 100%. and then just something like that because we have a lot of, spe- you know, sometimes like specific things where it's like, okay, we need someone who can skateboard 
for this, you know what I mean? And, and you know, if and we're probably going to need footage of it anyway. Yeah. So you totally. might as well have it on your profile. And also, yeah. like, why write it? Then someone has to read your entire profile and resume. Like, have a picture. Yeah. If you're a surfer and you've got a shot of you, you know, even if you're just holding your surfboard, you know, great. We can see your physique. We can see you've got your own board. That tells us something. And then have a clip, clip of you surfing somewhere in your profile. Like, that's, I 100% agree. Right. Anything the else about the that, end of day workflow that yes. you think is nice to mention for people? Because then we should spend the last part of this talking about callbacks because callbacks are a whole, whole animal beast, unto yeah. themselves. Oh, uh, the only thing I'd say is if you're, if you're, if you're leaving or if you're done as far as not as our day, uh, I always think a, a, a thank you to the, the assistant or the session director or the casting director on your way out is is always not that you want to stop in their office, but I'm just saying is always mm, just nice. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I think people are like so much. Oh, I got three more auditions, so they just they're on then the next thing. You know, I will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I all. will say um, not to the end of the day so much, but to lunch. We get an hour scheduled for lunch usually. Sometimes we have casting directors that are nicer and they schedule a little bit more. Um, but really what that means is we get 45 minutes because let's be honest, no one comes exactly at their time and then there's always a backlog and, and sometimes we have to wait for a partner to show up or whatever. And 45 minutes. If we're lucky, <laughs> if we're lucky, that's saying that everything flowed well, a yeah. well and 100%. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we're lucky if we get five minutes to throw some food in our mouth. Sometimes we don't even get that. Sometimes we work 100% completely through our lunch. Um, it's for actors to kind of know that. Like I had actors once begging me to like be seen, even though I'm supposed to be on lunch now. I'd finished my guys and they were like, please, like, can we go on? I threw them on, which meant I literally had like two minutes to go into the lunchroom, grab my food. And he was like, thanks, sorry for making you, uh, sorry for making you push your lunch. And I wanted to just like scream. My blood sugar was also low at that moment. But I was like, you didn't push my lunch. You took my lunch. Yeah. Like understanding that we don't get to then start 15 minutes late. Mm -hmm. We have to start back at our scheduled time. Mm -hmm. So th that window for we get to eat mm -hmm. gets shrunk every time someone comes late, every time someone wants to go at their, you know, at a different time and that kind of stuff. And I, I have to go at different times. We've all had to like make arrangements. So yeah. I, you know, I don't begrudge you that, but have some understanding and consideration of what that what means. What I tell people is that you can have no reasonable expectation that you will be seen if you do not come at your appointed time. Yeah. And that if it's, if, you know, if you sign in at or after one o'clock, you will, you can have no expectation that you will be seen. And that is not a me problem. That is a you problem and a biological problem of like, either I'm going to pass out because I'm hungry and I've been working my ass off, right? I need to take care of all the actors that are going to come from two o'clock on to the rest of my day by making sure I'm refreshed and ready to go and give them. A, so yeah, there's always, we'll just make an exception or just, you know, no, there's, there's a reason why we are carved out some time is that we work a very fast paced job. We have to be on the entire time. We have to be professional, we have to be efficient. We have to handle the technology. We have to do with personalities. We're dealing with corporate pressure. We're dealing with our casting director pressure. Like there's so much going on that I don't even during my lunch like to sit with the other session directors and just eat. I go into my quiet, dark little studio where I have a vitamin D deficiency, right? After doing this and I just sit in silence and I, I maybe will watch like some YouTube videos or something, but I am just decompressing so that I can refresh myself to be on again when that goes up. You take that from me or I allow myself to be manipulated, then it's harder for me to be able to be on with everybody for the rest of the day. So it's not personal. That's the nice thing about having a one to two lunch is like, it's not personal, it's the clock. Blame the clock, it ain't me. It is, it is time's fault. And so, yeah, but I think there's a, yeah, I think there's sometimes is like a misunderstanding of that, of not really understanding that we don't get a full hour. We are so lucky when we get a full hour yeah. for lunch, my good God. Yeah. And we don't stop. We don't get to even stop to like write an email or even reply to a text sometimes. Oh I my mean, gosh. I can't even go number two a lot of times because I would lose too much time just going to the restroom. But, and just like sometimes it's like I'm getting text messages from other casting directors trying to book me for like the next day or, or whatever. And so it's like jobs and I don't have time to like reply to them to get more jobs because I'm so behind or, or we're running, you know, we're doing whatever we're doing in our job. Like we don't have the time and so to to just understand that we're not being snippy or rude you know 
because we don't like you or whatever. It's just like sometimes we're dealing with a lot of stuff. If everybody takes the approach that don't make it all about you, we will all, we can all as a community uplift ourselves and everybody works out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so callbacks. So, you know, most people know this, but just in case people don't, the casting director doesn't get to decide who gets called back. Nor right? do we. Nor do we, right? The, the links that we send after a first day uh, of casting, the ad agency will have input, the director will have input, and then we will get a callback list of people that either both liked or that one or the other liked. And so when you are called back, that means somebody, maybe both, but somebody either on the agency side or on the director side liked what you did or thought you were appropriate and brought you in. Sometimes you'll get a first call to call back, which means we may have been light on the options and so they wanted to pad it with some more options or something changed or whatever the case may be. So that's when you might get a first call to a callback. Um, but the callbacks are a completely different vibe than the first calls because we can't control that room like we can when it's a first call. And we're dealing with people who don't understand what we do every day and aren't, have, haven't been trained to be efficient. And so that's why when you come to a callback, uh, you sometimes are waiting around a long time and it's not anything we can do anything about. If the clients are there, they're now in control, the director's gonna do what they gotta do. All we can do is try to support you and update you on what has changed and what's going on. Uh, thank God at least the client pays for overtime when you have a callback, not the casting director because it's on their, they know they're slowing down the process so it's on them. Um, but so, you know, we will do our, so here's what one, one you know, I guess pet peeve. Uh, you know, because things will have changed more than likely from the first call to the callback about the vibe and this and that, you really have to make sure you listen to what we've told you about how things change. And if you go in that audition room and you don't listen to what I had just told you outside about how things have changed, trying to do you a fucking favor, mm -hmm. and then the director gives you a note just because they want to explore or play or something like that, you interpret as in you did something wrong. Then you're like, oh, well, Sean told yeah, me to. Yeah, throw you under the bus. My God, will the wrath of my karmic energy <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, that's wreak havoc upon you in the future. In the callbacks, like, we are your best friend yeah. in a callback. We, I'm going out to the lobby to explain what's happening so that the the director doesn't have to explain it 5,000 times and he can get you to a base level. Like I want to get you to that base level of his main direction so that then he can play exactly. And if you throw me under the bus, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I agree with you. And not even that, sometimes what happens is we'll come out and explain it and then they'll come in and you kind yes. of have a preconceived notion. You won't do it and then you leave and the director's like, did you tell him what we talked about? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't process. So, and, you know. and also what sometimes happens is like I'll be just listening to what the director is saying over and over and over again. I'll make sure I go out to the lobby, share that with people. Mm -hmm. And then the director will still give that note again. But isn't it great that you know heard it twice? Mm -hmm. And so now when you go in, you look like a rock star mm -hmm. because you really did get time to process that. So that's mm -hmm. all we can do. We can't control the actual flow of things that much. I mean, certainly if they're getting really behind, we're like, okay, just so you guys know, we're about an hour behind, whatever. We try to encourage the clients. And sometimes they'll stop and uh, a. Uh, uh, a callback in progress yeah. to do like production a location meeting, thing location. or some mm -hmm. kind of production. Yeah. They have to take a call from New York, yeah. whatever it is. And then you guys are sitting out there waiting. So just already accept coming to a callback that it's going to be less than ideal, mm -hmm. you know? And so come with patience, come with generosity, come with appreciation for that part of the experience. Um, and, and also yeah. like understanding that it, things do change in the sense that sometimes you go in and it's exactly the same and I don't understand even why you had to come back for a callback. So I appreciate when you don't understand why you had to come back. Um, but sometimes it's like we come out, we give you the explanation. I give it to like a whole bunch of groups. I bring in the first group. We change it all in the room. Then I come back out and I say, okay, everything I just told you is different now. Now it's going to be this, this, and this. Okay, you ready? Let's go. And that's legit the amount of time you get to process it. It's like, mm -hmm. And then it changes again and it changes again. Like, You really have to be able to sit there for an hour thinking it's going to go one way and then seconds before you go in, find out it's going to go a completely different way and be able to just roll with it. Yeah, I think that's great. Great advice. And the other advice I give in the room is don't read too much into if they're responding or not responding. Yeah. You know, sometimes you leave it, you're like, oh, they were laughing, that's a that's a booking. 
and nothing happens, mm-hmm. you know? Sometimes it does. Sometimes they're on their laptops, they're not looking up, and you're like, oh, God, they're not even paying attention, you know? Have they already made their pick or whatever? And then you end up getting it, right? So don't, when you're in the room, obviously, be open, be available, bring what you've, you know, what, everything you can, but but don't read too much into what's going on behind the table, yeah. you know, yeah. on the couch. Well, because... I think people forget, too, that a lot of times those people who aren't looking up that are on their computers are ad people, um, production. The producer sometimes the producers, not as, you know, part of it. They're but... not as a part of it, and they're expected to still do a full day of work. Yeah. They still have emails to answer and things to, to get done, and their job is maybe later. Mm-hmm. They're there for something else, but they're still in the room, so don't get offended by and it. And only the director is the one that's really authorized to be interacting with the talent when they come in the room. I tell actors, it's always a blessing if you come in the room and anybody says anything or engages with you at all other than the one who's going to be responsible for getting that performance out of you on the day. Um, And so, you know, Toby Lawless, who's another session director friend of ours, uh, has this wonderful thing where he says, send out a ping when you come in the room. You should always feel good about coming in the room and be like, Hey guys, hope you know. Nice to see you. And then at the end of your audition, be like, "Thanks a lot. Have a great day." And no, no one should care whether you get anything back or not. But you just by sending that ping out, like a little radar ping. If any of that wonderful energy comes back, yay. If not, let them do their work. It has nothing to do with what you're there to do. Mm -hmm. You don't know what they're doing, although they might be looking up all your social media and things like that to make sure you haven't done or said something against the company or the brand as long as you're there because they don't want to get fired for you having complained about Target when you're auditioning for Target on social media or something like that. Mm-hmm. So keep in mind that, you know, they may be Google's looking right you there at their fingertips. That's yeah. true. That's mm-hmm. true. Yeah, and every room is different. Like some rooms, some callbacks I sit in, no one talks. Like it's just silence in there and it's very boring. And then others are just like fun and they're, you know, drinking wine by the end of the day and they're laughing and we're cracking jokes and it's such a good environment to be in. And so the actors don't, the actors only ever get their point of view. And I, I find, I I feel so bad for actors in that sense because as, as the session runners, we see everyone. So like if I have a, if I have a friend or an actor that I know well who comes in and they audition and they did a good job, but they didn't book it. And I know then they come to me, maybe they actually come to me or maybe I just think in my head they'll come to me and and ask like, how did I do? It's, it's not about what you did sometimes. It's just about the, the whole process. Sometimes you were not, not, not the best one. Sometimes there was just like a hundred other people who did things that were just different, better, worse. Sometimes it has to do with the, 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 combination of we need, you know, this ethnicity over here and this this ethnicity over there. But there's just like, there's so many variables. And sometimes even the energy of the clients can be a variable. And, and actors will come in and think like, oh, they were so quiet in there. I must have sucked. Or they were like, everyone was having a great time. I must have done well. Like there's, there's so many variables of things that are going on, but the actor only gets to see their experience and their mm-hmm. audition and nothing else. And then they try and fix things about themselves just based on that one experience. And I always like think it, it, it really sucks. Like I wish there was a way to have sort of been a part of the whole process so that they can see it wasn't me. Everything you did was great. It just was not your spot. Mm-hmm. And that's all there was to it. One other thing to keep in mind about callbacks is that it is often the case that your callback is not where your first call was. So always make sure you look and see that they might be at a yeah. location closer to LAX or something like that to make it you know good for the clients. Okay, last thing to talk about, and then we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, but so much amazing stuff for people listening to this to learn from. So this has been so much fun. But the last thing I want to uh, comment on is the selection process, right? So after you've had the entire callback, we're essentially, we'll have printed out your size sheets, right? And then the clients will more than likely, if they've been organized, like separate those out throughout the day where they put them in piles of yeses and nos and maybes or whatever. So they'll start with their yeses and put those sheets out and now start to try to build families or groups or this or that. Who do they like the most? And they'll start deliberations. And deliberations can take hours because they want to watch back who they saw or they, you know, maybe they, if they don't find it, they'll even look at first calls again. Did we miss anybody? This or that. Sometimes you'll book a job not even having gone to the callback because they just pulled you from the first call and they liked you so much. So it's like, how did that happen? Um, So anyway, what advice or insight can you give people on the client deliberations as to who they want to make their first choice? They will always have a backup or even two backups sometimes because something could happen to their first choice or the client could reject 
their first choice. Because remember, they don't make the decision. They have to go present it to the client. The client could say, no, we actually don't agree. We think your second choice is better for this role or whatever the case may be. So what other, I mean, certainly we know we've heard any, everything under the sun in terms of why somebody may have been, you know, knocked out of contention in a callback. I, I mean, I, to me, it just kind of reemphasizes this idea of um, some, some variety and like, you know, improv, because I've seen where they're like, oh, they could, like as you, as you go throughout the day, one of the things, they do start to have their favorites and, you know, and, and the director will kind of have a pile of like, oh, these are people I really like, these are people, eh, maybe not. And at the end of the day, a lot of those are the ones that we start with of like, let's review these people. And I, I, it's happened so many times where they're like, oh, this guy was hilarious. He was earlier in the day and they watch it and he's not as funny anymore because they've seen new stuff. Mm -hmm. Or he's just as funny as he was at the beginning and that's like the bar, right? And so, I mean, there, there's no advice, advice in that. That's more what we see. But my point with that is when they watch things back, they're re-catching things maybe they didn't see the first time or it's re-establishing like great choices you made or interesting things you did or behavior that sticks out from other people. So I think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind when you're in the audition process that, you know, if they're giving you three or four takes, it's like keep bringing them from some variety because we also edit it down. Usually we didn't get a chance to talk to this in a callback. They do seven takes. Sometimes you send all seven, but some, usually they say take their two best takes, right? And, and, and a lot of times it's like their last two because the director hopefully has worked with you and you've gotten better and not worse. Um, and we edit it down. We send like your two, you know, we send your two best takes, but they'll watch like all six takes, all seven takes to see what, what you're bringing. So I think that to me is something that kind of stands out. I think that that speaks in mind because once it comes to the selection process, I saw somebody book a part because of her shoes. Okay. And, and that was it. Actor A came in and actor B came in and actor A crushed it. I thought, everybody thought, actor B at the end of the day, they did a full body shot. This was back with Polaroids. And they looked and like, oh, look at her shoes. You know, my cousin has shoes just like those. Yeah, oh, she's really stylish. Yeah, that's it, she's the one. It was her shoes mm -hmm. and that's it. And it's, it can be as arbitrary as that. You don't have any control over that. What you do have control over though is understanding that what you leave on the tape, what you leave as, as your digital footprint, that's what's going to be reviewed. So please don't come in and try to wow us with a big comedic shtick and, oh, I'm going to kill him. And yes, be cordial, be friendly, be outgoing, be who you are, be genuine and sincere. But know that the joke you told at 10.13 in the morning isn't going to be what they remember at 6.30 at night when they're doing the review. It's going to be what you left, your work on camera. So understand that it is you don't have to come in and turn on this big personality show because you think that's going to book you the part your work on camera is what's going to book you the part and i always say that like the only time i personally am upset coming out of callback or when i don't book the job is when i i know that i did not do my best in that room if i brought what I bring to the table, this is, I'm an expert in me. I'm an expert in, in knowing how to, to utilize my instrument. So I'm going to deliver to you that this is how I see the character. This is what I do. And if this is the direction you want to go, you'll book me. And if I know that I've brought what I need to bring and they didn't go with me, then I know I wasn't the right choice for them. And that's fair. And maybe next time I will be, maybe not, whatever. Um, I can never be upset by that. The only time I'm upset is when I leave that room and go, Fuck, I did not bring what I know I can bring. Uh, and I think every actor should, that's all you can do because there are so many cooks in that kitchen. Like I have seen the same kinds of things like where, you know, people are loving actor A and like they're starting to like rework the script around these. I, this just happened to me like last week. These two guys came in together and the thing they did was so funny that they were starting to rework the script and say like we should actually have two people here instead of one. And we'll take, you know, an actor away from this section so that we can mm -hmm. have this second actor. There's so many factors out of your control. Yeah. yeah. And then like the the yeah. like their oh. boss came to like review afterwards. and He was like, no, I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't like that. And it was like everyone in the room was so gobsmacked because they thought they'd found this like awesome idea and he just shut it down. And then that person all of a sudden didn't get a job that they were going to get a second ago. And it's mm -hmm. like, th there's, there's, there's always something. There's always a story I, I of like some ridiculous. We want to book, you know, as actors, we want to book, we want to work, but there is something great. I try to try to remind people that, um, 
When you're getting a call back, it means you're doing good stuff. When you're getting put on a veil, it means you're in the running. And the other nice thing about that is um, like a little residual benefit, which is like your agency, your commercial agency, and the casting director are saying your name three or four times for all that stuff, which is always great because to me, that's also helping build relationships. Yes. So even though, yes, we want a book, that is the goal. Um, you know, every time they have to call and say, Sean Sharma's got a call back, Sean Sharma's on a veil, and then you're, you know, it reminds your, your, your agent that you're doing good stuff. It reminds the casting director that this guy's doing good stuff. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that's also yeah. just something to keep in mind, to yeah. take away. Oh, I went in to like bring Christmas presents to my agents and they were like, oh, you're doing so well. You're getting a call back for everything. And in my head, I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but in their head, I am because I'm getting a lot of callbacks. So it's like, oh, for everything. I'm cool. Just, just keep thinking that. And so that, you know, to wrap <laughs> things up on the callback stuff, just to reiterate is that, yeah, the most random things could get in the way of whether you book a particular spot or not. The yeah. key is to be consistently great in the room, to know all, uh, you know, listening through this, this uh, three hours that we've given over these two episodes as to how things work, um, making sure you know what you're doing when you're coming in those rooms. If you're doing everything you possibly can be doing right, the numbers will work in your favor and you'll, mm -hmm. you'll book. So. And I do think what you were saying, John, is like it's that's the best way to sort of gauge where you're at because, because you do only get your perspective going into the room. It's so hard. And sometimes you can dismantle things that were working so well um, or not fix things that weren't working. And I think one of the best ways, ways to gauge is how many auditions am I getting? Then how many callbacks am I getting? Then from there, how many avails am I getting? And, and if... And if you're getting a ton of auditions, but you're not getting any callbacks, something's wrong. Yeah. And if you're getting a bunch of callbacks, but no avails, then that's where the issue is. And then if you're getting avails, but no booking, then that's a totally separate problem that needs to be fixed. And so it's trying to figure out where you are on that scale. And you'll see if you're getting better by those numbers moving up. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so thank much for having me. Thank you.